Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for January 14th, 2021. I'm Joe Lynch. I am joined once again on this first show of the new year, legislative update with Senator Pat Jalen. Senator Jalen, welcome back. We took a little bit of a break in December, but you're back at work. We are. I say, so that, I say that tongue in cheek, Senator Jalen, because I happen to know that um, the legislature was working right through the wee hours it, through December. And uh, I jokingly said to the Senator, um, how was your three day break? But um, so Senator Jalen, you brought some guests with you today. Um, to, I'd like to welcome them personally, and then I'm gonna turn this over to you so we can begin the discussion. Um, we have Arlene Germain from the Mass Advocates for Nursing Home Reform and Paul Hollings of the Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. So J Senator Jalen, that just is a very brief description of our guests. But if you want to take it over from here and speak with them, and then I may chime in with a question or two. You might. Uh, so I thought this would be a good show to start the new year with because over 2020 during the pandemic, people became much more aware of nursing homes. And in March, uh, nursing homes across the country uh, were devastated. and over two thirds of the deaths in Massachusetts have been of people in nursing homes, or at least that was true a month or two ago. Um, younger people are dying now, uh, more likely. Uh, so uh, that has called into question the whole continuum of care for older and disabled people. And these are two of the leaders in that conversation uh, Arlene Germain, I've known for several years as uh, the co-founder and legislative uh, a policy director uh, for Mass Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. And I, I'm going to ask her to talk about what the experience uh, was like of people and their families in, and their staff in nursing homes. And Paul Hollings, uh, who is the director of Somerville Cambridge Elder Services, um, has a range of services um, in home care. And I'll ask him to talk about that, what the experiences of people, um, both clients and staff were in the nursing home uh, experience. But then I, th I hope we will have time to talk about what lessons we can learn from the experience uh, that people have had during the pandemic, because it has raised um, consciousness of the problems that may continually exist and made the solutions much more urgent. So Arlene, could you talk a little bit about what, oh, Paul also just to be clear, has also had experience as a uh, uh, director of a few nursing, several nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. So he brings a wide range of experience that can talk about what we need to do to advance the whole uh, continuum. So I think they both know these things. So Arlene, could you talk a little bit about uh, what happened inside nursing homes and what you what the administration's response was and how that worked? Um, sure. Um, it's good to be here and I'm very glad that you're bringing this up as, as, as an issue. It's very, very important. Um, you were right when you said that it was 66% um, uh, of, of the, all of the deaths in Massachusetts where um, <clears throat> approximately 7,700 nursing home residents have passed away. It really is quite remarkable. Um, and this represents 20% um, of all of the nursing home residents in the state. So it has been devastating. Um, when we were all learning about COVID at the beginning, um, it was uh, thought to be a good thing to stop visitations in nursing homes because we didn't understand how it was spreading. Um, and it was the only thing we could do. <clears throat> but having done that um, has sadly created another problem because <clears throat> 
um, visitations were terminated. The ombudsman who are um, um, have the um, <clears throat> right to see residents anytime that they want. They're under a federal program, uh, federal slash state program. They were not allowed to see residents. The Department of Public Health um, under the auspices of um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government were prevented from going into the nursing homes. Um, visitors, loved ones could not go in to see the, so it was complete isolation for the nursing home residents for the first three months of the pandemic. And during the summer with the warmer weather, it was opened up to outside visitations, but not all residents could participate in that. And now that winter's here, um, <clears throat> indoor visitations were started up, but then stopped again um, because um, we're hitting red zones um, and COVID while it was going away a little bit has come back in force and it is infiltrating nursing homes again. So what we have learned and what sadly the, the, the nursing home residents have learned is this isolation is devastating also to residents. Um, you may have folks that are very cognizant um, and then you will have folks who have dementia, severe dementia um, and just don't understand what's going on and they decline very quickly. And the folks that are cognizant are feeling like they're in prison um, we've found that with the, the stop of families going in there, many of them were, um, you know, helping to feed their loved ones, um, you know, keeping them company, providing, providing a whole range of services um, to, to supplement um, the, the, um, the staff. And now during the pandemic, um, the staff sadly has also succumbed to the disease. So there's even less staff. I remember earlier on in the pandemic, there was 40% less staff. So this is one family we really needed, but they couldn't go in. And we've heard cases of where um, residents were becoming malnourished because they weren't being fed consistently. They weren't being bathed for a month. Um, and as I said before, the emotional impact was quite severe. So we had a crisis going on within a crisis. And we're still trying to work our way out of that. Um, and I, I don't want to take up the whole show with this, but uh, you know, I, I think um, those were the main points that, that, that you wanted to hear on that issue. So that, that I certainly can remember uh, especially like in March with families calling and not being able to be in touch with their, their mothers, for example, and, and administrators crying on the phone because they didn't have enough staff to, as you say, to feed people even. So that was a terrible time. I hope we're a little bit out of that now, but we are going to want to find out what the, what we need to do to prevent um, prevent this going forward. Prevent future Absolutely. outbreaks, but also to reduce isolation. But I want to ask Paul, what happened in, uh, in the nursing home field? Because their workers have to go into people's homes. So in, in the home care field, um, we were shell-shocked at the beginning like everybody else. Uh, we had to learn uh, what was going on, and uh, we, we pulled back in terms of uh, visits, and, and many of our clients uh, um, declined uh, the same amount of visits that they were getting. So we actually cut back quite a bit to, uh, for people who could afford to or people who had family home with them who could, who could support them. We didn't have any PPE at the very beginning. Uh, that's personal protective equipment, masks and the like. And so for the first month, it was, uh, it was a little bit chaotic, but we did continue services throughout that time uh, to uh, the vast majority of our clients in the community. We continued home delivered meals. And in fact, we, we saw a surge in demand for home delivered meals. And even though some of our drivers were getting sick or, 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 or uh, having to 
quarantine because of, of COVID, we had an outpouring of volunteers from the community who jumped in and, and helped to supplement uh, what we were doing. And in fact, that's been one of the great things about this. We've had volunteers uh, supplement our work there and uh, in calls to people to alleviate loneliness. And right now in helping to uh, uh, develop tech technological skills, you know, the simple working with a computer and getting online. Um, but we've been able to uh, maintain all of our services in home care and adult family care, protective services. Uh, um, we've been, we still have been going out into the community, um, judging where, judging what the risk is, balancing risk and trying to figure out what, what makes sense. And also, frankly, it's, it's about uh, client choice as well. If they don't want somebody visiting, uh, they get to make that choice. So um, the good news uh, for, is that people across the state, people who are enrolled in, in home care programs were affected by COVID at a fraction of the level of people living in nursing homes, despite their uh, similar age and comorbidities in many cases. Uh, so our estimate is that you were 15 times as likely to die in a nursing home as, as if you were getting home care services. Uh, so it's uh, been a, you know, the, the, the Home care, home and community-based services have been a huge success in this time in supporting people. Our mission is to support people to live in the setting of their choice. And as a person who spent about 20, 25 years managing nursing homes, I can confidently state that nobody wants to live in a nursing home, um, or almost nobody. Uh, so I think it's going to be very important down the road that we are supporting home and community-based services even more than we already do. Massachusetts is a leader in providing those services. And Senator Jalen, you've been a leader in that effort. Mm -hmm. um, we have converted uh, our spending from being very heavily dependent on, uh, on, on nursing homes to much more uh, home community-based services. And there's more that we can do. Uh, we need to make sure that we are paying the caregivers appropriately. Um, we need to uh, make it more affordable for middle-income people to get home and community-based services. And in fact, our association has two bills that we're supporting. One's called Enough Pay to Stay to make sure that the, uh, the personal care workers, the home health aides and the homemakers are getting paid sufficiently uh, to do their job. And then another is the uh, affordable, an act to, to make home care affordable, which would change the sliding fee scale and make it easier for somebody to afford to get services which will help uh, prevent them going into a nursing home. Because frankly, people who are middle income, once they go into a nursing home, it just takes about two or three months before all their money is gone. And then their state is paying for their stay through Medicaid. So, um, but the real thing is that people don't wanna be there. And to the extent they, they really want to maintain their control. And so our job is to, to help them do that. And I, I'm very pleased to say that we've had a positive impact on that uh, over the last 10 months. It, has certainly been a strain though uh, within our community as well. well. I think that what you said is is very true. I have never met somebody who is eager to move into a nursing home. Um, and But I think what we need to be addressing as both ends is uh, making sure that everybody has a choice of their setting, yes. uh, no matter what their income is uh, for, uh, for wealthy people. Uh, one of the reasons nursing home occupancy is down is that people who have adequate resources choose to live in uh, an assisted living rather than in uh, going to a nursing home. And so, but people who are on Medicaid, for example, uh, may not have as many options or people who are, as you say, middle income. Yeah, people who have the resources will, on the whole, choose uh, nursing home care a lot less. Uh, I don't mean to say that nursing, I mean, nursing homes are always going to have a role, an important role, uh, to take care of people who really need the service. Um, but if we have more affordable options for people, we will have fewer people in nursing homes and more people receiving services at home. At the same time, we need to make sure that people in nursing homes are safe um, and have we need to look at the nursing home structure. For example, uh, the administration is moving towards saying you can't have more than two people mm -hmm. in a room. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the reasons mm -hmm. there is so much, there was so much uh, spread in nursing homes is, well, there were 
two things that I can think of that should be changed. One is shared rooms so that people would be in a room with somebody who is sick. Um, and the other is that I think probably most people agree that the way that the virus got into nursing homes was is through staff who came from uh, communities where people worked in dangerous jobs and often worked in more than one nursing facility. So I think that was probably the most common source of spread, not not family members, although that could have been. Um, Ar Arlene, do you want to talk about what you would like to see change in the nursing home space? And Paul has talked a little bit about what needs to change in, in the community-based services, but we might do a little bit more on both of those. Senator Jalen, um, before, before we jump into what's needed going forward, I, did, I just wanted to say a couple of th very short things for you know, folks who have never experienced a family member being either in in-home rehab or at-home rehab or in nursing for long-term nursing care facility or assisted living facility or at-home care by a VNA or or by you know any agency that assists assists them in staying in their own home. You're looking at somebody here on screen who dealt with that for seven years with four family members. So my late mom and dad, one of my oldest sisters and her husband, in one way or another, they all towards the end of their lives had some type of assistance, some type of care. And I just wanted to say to both Paul and Arlene, I'm with you guys. I mean, I understand very, very acutely aware of the intricacies of either nursing home um, care or at home care or rehab care, or in the case of a couple of family members, isolation care in hospital. So I totally get Arlene. I, one thing I wanted to pick up on was the sense of isolation that people feel, whether they're at home or in a nursing home or they are in rehab or they're in hospital. This pandemic has created something that I think we need to pay attention to, which is that sense of isolation, especially by older people in our community. We are, and I say we, because I am of that age, we are less likely to be connected to the outside world via a device with the exception of a telephone. And during the pandemic, that came front and center, especially for folks in nursing homes that their outside world connection was either a visit by a family member, interaction with staff, the telephone, or watching television. They were not savvy on the technology to stay in touch, most that I know of, to stay in touch with the outside world. So I, I hope you know we can have another conversation about the isolation that folks felt. And one of the things that caught me when you said it is that that isolation contributed in some cases to a rapid decline by these patients. So I think it's, it has, once again, the pandemic has shown us the underbelly of some of the structures that we have in place that we need to pay attention to. I didn't mean to go on the soap, soap no. box on that, but no. I wanted to give you that you're talking to somebody who's experienced it yeah. and I totally get it. Um, moving forward, Paul, one thing that you said is that, you know, the your clients themselves may have been resistant to taking the services, to letting people into their home. I mean, that's something that where telehealth may be, yes. you know, employed going forward. I know that I have Lifeline, you know, I took care of both parents in home. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to do that, but I had Lifeline. They loved the idea of Lifeline. If I wasn't home and had to go out for 15 minutes, my father would automatically trip the lifeline so he could talk to somebody. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> Senator Jalen knows my family. She knows that that is not beyond the pale for us to do. But I wanted to jump in, just kind of set that setting, and then for the remainder, let Arlene and Paul and Senator Jalen um, move forward with what do we need going forward? So, Senator Jalen, thank you. Arlene, I think you have the, the floor there. Mm. 
Well, you know, everything you said was was critically important. So, so thank you. And it does dovetail into what I'm about to say. Um, as leading this organization for 20 years, and I have colleagues who have been in this 40 years trying to improve nursing homes, and knowing that that's not the first choice for so many, um, we really will be needing nursing homes until we can at least transfer over to the home care that we're talking about. Um, so there is going to be a period, I, I'm going to say at least 20 years, you know, we're looking at this long term um, to get all the services in place that um, people with disabilities might need and, and some of the folks who are sicker within um, nursing homes set up. I hope it goes quicker, but there's that possibility. And there will always be a need for a nursing home depending on, on um, the health of the person. Um, but what we can do with, um, and, and it is wonderful that the state has reducing all of the, the uh, number of people within a room to two. Um, we're in another organization, Dignity Alliance Massachusetts, that formed because of the pandemic, because we saw all of these urgent matters. And that organization is going for a, a single room um, and private baths bathrooms. So, um, and it would be on the um, a greenhouse um, project, which, which I know Paul is very familiar with. Um, and these are, uh, it's a small home setting um, that we started, oh gee, it must be 20 years ago now. Um, and we have several of these in, in Massachusetts um, where they really are single rooms and probably no more than 10 rooms in a building. There, there's um, specifically built small buildings. And we can convert- A obviously. unit, right? It could be a unit within a building? Yes, it can. Um, we have the only high rise of these in Chelsea. Um, and I'm sorry to say the name is escaping me right the now. Leonard Florence Center. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, the Leonard Florence Center. And so the way they do it is they have the building divided on each side of the building and on each floor, there's um, a 10 unit um, unit. And in the center of that, you, each of these units is where you have your dining room and your kitchen. So it's like living in a home where you can smell the food. You can partake in the making of the food as well. And so everybody has a private room and it's been working out very well in, in that venue. So that's important. Another huge important um, issue is staffing. And this is where the state is also helping. Um, we need to have um, well-paid and sufficient number of staff, more than sufficient from an advocate's point of view. So um, in September, um, Massachusetts did require um, three and a half hours a day of care um, per resident per day. And uh, that's starting, I think, in January. And there is also um, a, a pay increase that's going in for them. Um, during the pandemic. And we need to ensure that they have um, medical coverage and other, other types of coverages to create a stable workforce. And that will minimize the staff from having to hold down two jobs, which is incredibly difficult any, for anybody in any, in any business that you're in. But the kind of stress that they're under daily taking care of such you know, um, sick people that they have to be able to focus and stay in one building and have and a not spread the disease out. from one to not spread the disease. If, so I could, if I could, if I could, just add, Thank Arlene, you. is that the part of the problem with nursing homes is that they were developed along a medical model for a living environment, <clears throat> so that <laughs> yes. it was uh, they were modeled on hospitals, and nobody wants to live in a hospital. Uh, they, uh, yeah. I couldn't support more the idea of moving towards private rooms. <clears throat> the elimination of three and four bedrooms is a good idea. I yeah. would say maybe set a 10 year goal of converting them all to private rooms. Yeah. Um, but and, and on, talk on about side. what you do in <laughs> adult foster care and other ways to create small congregate 
talk about that. Yeah, so uh, well, we have an adult foster, foster care program uh, where we support caregivers who have uh, people in their home, often relatives uh, who they care for. We provide care, man uh, care management to them and uh, uh, nursing support, and, uh, but they live with the person they're caring for and then they get a, a small subsidy for doing that. Um, that was actually a very successful model, <clears throat> excuse me, during COVID because we had caregivers in the home with them. So they, they were, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they were isolated, but not to the extent that, that other people were. Uh, so that's, that's a very successful program. And we think it's a, a real option for people going forward, um, if, especially if they, have if they have a family member at home, um, perhaps unemployed, uh, and they uh, have a greater incentive now not to move into a nursing home. Um, but I did want to uh, just touch on something Joe said about isolation. I mean, it, we live in a society where we're increasingly being isolated from each other, and it does impact elders more than uh, than anybody else. And one one program that we have, the states uh, just started in the last uh, couple of years, is called Elder Mental Health Outreach Teams, in which we uh, provide counseling and care management for people who have uh, mental health challenges in the community. Uh, there's um, a large percentage of elders uh, suffer from depression, living alone in the community, uh, lonely. Uh, so I think a, a big uh, challenge going forward for us is, is how do we address that? Um, our our M, we call it MHOT for short, but our MHOT staff have been absolutely dedicated during this time. And I think they were the first ones going out and doing visits after we all got over the, the shock and knew how to protect ourselves. But I, I think uh, identifying ways to address isolation in general. It's, it's nursing home isolation, it's in, in the home isolation as well. Um, so I, I absolutely support that idea. I will just say one thing about visitors in nursing homes, I, I couldn't agree more. 30 years ago, I started uh, as the uh, administrator at Neville Manor in Cambridge, and I encountered a sign when I walked in that said visiting hours 12 to eight, and I immediately replaced it with one saying visiting hours are 24 hours a day. So I. Yeah, they are. Absolutely. That's a great support. way to end with a little sign of hope. Um, and we, I see a note that we're about out of time. Uh, I feel like we probably want to continue this conversation, not just um, with each other, but in this venue again. Uh, well, Senator Jalen, if I can jump in, you're always welcome back. Paul and Arlene, welcome back. But it sets the stage for at some point, all of us are going to need care, whether it's in home with visiting folks coming into our home or spending time in a nursing home. Uh, one thing that I did forget um, to say is that my experience is also with uh, hospice facilities. So, you know, the older we get, the more we have to realize that our bodies are changing, our minds are changing. Um, I would like to personally invite both of you back anytime you want to come back. Senator Jalen has an open standing invitation with her other legislative uh, colleagues. But for now, we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you so much to both of you. We will be putting a link to your individual organizations on the video. Okay. Thank you Senator so much. Jalen, very much. Thank you very much. Paul, Arlene, thank, thank you. you for the Somerville Media Center. I'm Joe Lynch. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.